All right. We thought we were done with the Passover. <laughs> Turns out we're not. <laughs> so uh, to get us started this morning, one of the things that I was looking or kind of was jotting down a few notes about is how many times the Passover has been explained and what aspect the Passover has been explained and how we have a bunch of little pieces here or there sprinkled throughout a basically a few chapters of the Bible here. Hmm. And so I am curious what you all have picked up as this has kind of been repeated ad infinum hmm. at this point. So what are our, um, what are some of the different details that we've seen pop up so far with the different explanations of how to celebrate the Passover? Yeah, Clay? Hmm. Unleavened bread. Mm -hmm. That must be mentioned many, many times. Right. <laughs> in in this chapter, is this chapter 13? Yes. Where the bloody chapter that provides the rationale for all the burnings at the stake. Um, my, burnings yeah, at the stake? Uh, That's new to me. Don't do this. You're going to be killed. Uh, you what know, verse I, are you looking at? You know what? I was in Deuteronomy. <laughs> oh! <laughs> <laughs> that is weird. Well, they, they, I'm really sorry. <laughs> now, so, go, so goes Rogue. <laughs> no! Oh, no, no. What I would say is Sue was reading the notes because that's another thing I checked up on is oh, when I was reading down video. below for extra context. Yeah. Uh, the commentator, at least in my Bible, gave a few references of when it's brought up again. Later in Exodus, in 34, it's brought back up. And then in Deuteronomy, which is uh, Deuteronomy is Moses's like farewell speech right before they cross over into the promised land. It's brought up there again, how to celebrate the Passover. And uh, that Deuteronomy has a little bit higher stakes as to I what have... happens if you don't. Yeah, I read, I actually read chapter 13 before, but I, I okay, I'm going to be out of it then. <laughs> That's all right. Yeah. So what are some of the other elements that we've seen pop up a few times? Well, substituting an animal for the firstborn human baby. Mm -hmm. Something that occurred to me. Yeah, so we have the talk once again of firstborns and like what's the significance of the firstborn? What are you supposed to do with them? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any and other common the, elements? The uh, uh, what God has done for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the He's, common refrain, do this because this is what God's done for you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the admonition is always there to be sure to do this every year. Mm -hmm. You've got to keep doing this. And one thing that struck me that when it says that it will serve as a sign on your hand and a reminder on your forehead. Now, what what is the specific significance of that, if anything? I hold on to that question. I, I, uh, that's one of the details. I, I pulled up some pictures so you all could see. Oh, okay. Um, so hold on. I don't, I will answer that in a moment. But Mary Ellen, I saw a hand there too. Well, I was also going to bring up that it mentions teaching the children. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, become a common element as well involving the children. Mm -hmm. And, so and then we'll celebrate. Yes. Um, you will celebrate, but you can't have any yeast in your house, but on the next day you celebrate. So somehow you got to yes. hurry up in the morning and make some leavened bread or something. <laughs> so uh, no, no leavened bread on Passover. It's the day it, like you celebrate and the celebration still doesn't have any leavening in it. So it's just the next day you can start your yeast production yeast. again. <laughs> So with this in mind, with all of these elements we've heard repeated again and again, there is one thing um, that scripture really hasn't focused on too much. And I think this is notable going back to some of the our conversations we've had quite a few times. 
um, the comment of like, this is really brutal. This is like very heavy handed of God. But what we see is there is a lot of time spent on all the details of how to celebrate Passover, how that like you are to remember what God has done. This is a freedom, like how God freed you. So it's not to say they aren't keeping details, but I don't, I'm wondering if you all notice how quickly they s moved through the actual event of the killing of the firstborns of the Egyptians. Mm -hmm. That when it comes to a matter of focus and like, what are the people concerned with? The mm -hmm. killing of the Egyptians, like just flies by. They say like, God moved through the land, the firstborns were killed, there was wailing, and then there's the response. There's only like two or three verses that actually is spent in in the actual act of the the or the slaughter part of it, the death part, the killing. But it's far more concerned, it seems, at least in detail, with what you are to remember, how you're to remember it, and what the people of God have done in response. And I'm wondering if you all notice that or have any kind of reflections on the fact that the event itself passes quickly. Yeah, Mary Ellen. Well, I'm, if I put myself in the place of the Israelites at that point, after all the Egyptians had done to them mm -hmm. over the years, they could have easily felt this was just retribution. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because the Egyptians were brutal to the Israelites for right. many, 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 many years. And, you know, mm -hmm. not that brutal. I, I can see how they could just justify it and say, okay, scores even, you know, let's move on. We're pleading for our lives or whatever here. Mm -hmm. I, the way you say that almost makes me think of um, the best revenge is a life well lived. Like, mm -hmm. we're not thinking about you. We're not spending time on you. Mm -hmm. Like, we settled the score and now we're moving on. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Any other thoughts of kind of this this disproportionate focus on some details and not the others? I suppose it, it depends too upon what generally happened at that time with captive populations and so forth. If it you know it wasn't uncommon, well you captured them and then you just slaughtered everybody, you know. Well, that's the way wars were fought. That's the way captivity uh, mm -hmm. was done and so forth. And it was sort of acceptable. At that right. Well, there, there's also a passage a bit back. I, I, I forgot who was it, Joseph. Somebody went mm -hmm. into a, uh, yeah, the trickster goes into this uh, a land and says, if you all get circumcised, then you can come with us. And then they kill them. Right. Like After, in, yeah. in some ways, they give more details in that story than they do in how this final plague plays out. Like some of the other things, like we have details of like the Nile turning to blood and it was turned to blood in the vessels and far away. And like we have more imagination. When it talks about the frogs, they're like, there was frogs in the kneading bowls. And we have like details of like how far and wide. We have details of the like the locusts and how much they ate and the devastation. And here it is very much like left ambiguous of mm. like, there isn't any focus on like, how did God kill the firstborns? Did they die quietly in their sleep? Was it yelling? Like, like there is no imagery given. It's just kind of stated that it happened. And I find, um, I bring this up only to say, it is important what the writers are writing about. Mm -hmm. And so I just thought that that would be an interesting thing as we are here talking about how to celebrate the Passover. Oh, give, give me, uh, there we go. Whoop. <laughs> sorry about that um but when you're thinking about like what are they focused on they are far more interested in the party 
for years to come. <laughs> They're far more interested about freedom. They're not really interested in the violence of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So with that, let's actually jump in and kind of um, we're uh, unless you all see details you want to focus on, which please speak up, I'm going to go pretty fast through this first little bit. So I'm going to first, though, I'm going to give us kind of our placement to show us once again the repetitiousness. So starting in 12, 12-1, 12, uh, 12 1 to 13 explains how to sacrifice when you're celebrating the Passover. 12, 14 through 20 is a tells you how to celebrate with unleavened bread. 12, 21 through 27 is an explanation to the elders of Israel what the plan of action is. 28 to 40 is the actual event and the escape. Last chapter, or last week, we talked about 43 through the beginning of this chapter, uh, verse 2, which is all focused on who can eat. And once again, we have the rephrasing of um, the how to celebrate the unleavened bread, which lasts from about verse 3 to verse 10. The other thing that commentators point out is with all these different nuggets and different re-explanations, this kind of shows that there may have been many traditions of how to celebrate the Passover that were combined when editing this together, that there mm. may have been some communities that focused more on the sacrifice, some communities that focus more on the unleavened bread. And this one, as Larry, you pointed out, it has the additional detail of remembering it on your hand and on your forehead. Mm -hmm. I don't actually know what this means in the time and the place uh, when it was like originally written, but what I can show you is what it looks like for people who hold on to this nugget today. So I'm gonna share screen, here we go. So these are called Jewish phylacteries and this is literally, um, this mm. is how people honor this today. So there's a little box, uh, two little boxes and they have a little piece of scripture. You can see the Jewish letter on the outside and they tie it to their forehead. They tie it to their arm and wrap a leather strap. So it's wrapped around their hand as well. And the tradition is you wear these during morning prayer. This is not something that is done by all, like every Jewish tradition. It tends to be some of the more Orthodox uh, Jews that tend to do this more. Uh -huh. But this is how you do it. Or one way to do it today is the, the phylacteries. And mm. you can see in this illustration, uh, this is a very old print that looks... Um, uh, that shows you that this has kind of been going on for a while. So that looks vaguely 16th century, or 17th, 17th, 18th century. Anyways, traditional print. So this has been a traditional way to hold on to this one piece, this one detail. So have you all ever seen uh, seen these before? No? Yeah. No? Okay. I mean, that kind of makes sense that it's normally done. They don't, or as I understand, a lot of people or most people don't wear them around town. They do it while praying. So sometimes if, you, if you've ever visited Jerusalem, you can see people at the Western Wall is a common place where you'll see people praying with the phylacteries on. Mm. So that's just that small. Yeah, Clay. Okay. Is it men only? Because when we were at the Western Wall, we were on the women's side. I don't remember seeing that on anyone, but it wasn't Passover either. So what are uh, people the only who do this? So this is what or so this is common when or for just um this isn't just like a Passover thing. This is a like daily prayer when people will wear these. And it may be more common with men, but even in my just brief Google search, there are images of women doing it. Um, so yeah, that's one that I don't actually know. Uh, I'd have to research <laughs> later. If I'm going to guess it's maybe more common. Uh, there may be a tradition, depending on what tradition you follow, certain things are only for men and certain things are opened up for women. So yes mm. and no, possibly. Don't know. Mm. 
All right. So any details um, of the from from verse three to verse ten that you all wanted to that you noticed in this once again another round of telling us how to celebrate the Passover. All right, it's, then it seems like it's maybe one of those times where we're dealing with some repetitiousness again. <laughs> All right, so this next section, I think, clears up some of the things that we've been kind of talking about, and I knew it was referenced somewhere in scripture. I just forgot where. So let's talk about consecration of the firstborn. So just as a small definition or definitional clarity, because there are a few terms that are kind of thrown around and are used somewhat interchangeably. We have redeem and consecration. Consecration is the act of making something holy. So uh, doing something that then sets it apart from the normal crowd, the, from the mundanity, you make it holy by doing something. Whereas redeeming is the, uh, we've talked about it before, but like if you redeem a, someone in servitude, you're paying the price for them, like literally paying the person who owns them and then buying their freedom. Redeeming someone in like a sense of a widow, um, because that also comes up if you remember the story of Ruth and Boaz. Boaz is her kinsman redeemer which brings her out of a from one state to out of it to a state of being a wife having land that is productive and being cared for so redeeming it in that sense is kind of fulfilling the family promise but it does have a monetary association as well and here we see that redeeming the firstborn has connotations of sacrifice and what you're supposed to do ah okay can so, I just, mm -hmm. can I just yeah, go for it. I needed to look it up in the dictionary. Okay, yeah, go for it. Um, under the um, definition of redeem, the last is theology, mm -hmm. and it's to deliver from sin and its consequences by means of a sacrifice offered for the sinner. So, um, the sin and its consequences, I thought, was kind of interesting. So. So that is a specifically Christian definition. That idea of redemption only comes about after Jesus. Okay. Um, there is the way that um, the Jewish community deals with ideas of sin is not disconnected, but it's not the same necessarily. So um, we can get into that when we get when we get farther in Exodus. So uh after at about chapter 20 it switch uh exodus switches from like story time to the beginning of the legal code so we're going to get into some of that and just like hold on to that a little bit of how does this community deal with sin and people being imperfect but we've seen so far if you think about the stories of abraham who messes up all the time he's not really called a sinner he's still considered mm -hmm. righteous and even with the his sons and grandsons like jacob is a very flawed human but there's no idea of sin being talked about in that way and so we see this notion kind of develop over time and our christian ideas of sin are very different so we're going to hold on to that one for a bit but there is kind of that notion there's still the notion of like humans being imperfect and like we have to do something for god because of our like mortality of like our imper imperfections and kind of this is one of the ways to deal with it so is this a a, a play, placating god or getting your sin wiped away what in the old testament what exactly did i didn't i never read that and I kept thinking this doesn't sound like you know I think if you redeem something well you have these 
remember the green stamps that you used to get in the mail? You mm -hmm. redeem mm -hmm. the stamp at the grocery store and <laughs> mm -hmm. it's used in all sorts of different ways. Uh huh. So let's hold on to that idea of like, we redeem coupons a lot. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And when we redeem a coupon, what we do is we give a slip of paper and we are owed something, right? Either a percentage off, sometimes yeah. it's buy one, get one, but our when we redeem it, we get something out of it, right? Yeah. That's actually not a bad way to think about it. Okay. So let's let's actually go to go to this section and like talk through some of what's uh what we find here. So in verse 11, we start with very much once again the promise of God. This is going back to very for the promise God made to Abraham in that covenant, the Lord brought when. So this is future tense. We're preparing for this journey into the promised land. When the Lord has brought you into the land of the Canaanites, as he swore to you. So we're bringing you to this land. Remember the promise. Uh, swore to you and your ancestors and has given it to you. You shall set apart the Lord all of the first openings of the womb, all of the firstborn livestock that are males to be for the Lord. So, um this is kind of is still relating to the 10th plague not right now to the egyptians but to the livestock that god claimed all the firstborns of the livestock so in this sense god has almost it's um using the metaphor sue that you brought up of kind of like using a coupon god's like i am i am owed the firstborns these ones are mine it's not necessarily placating to like save stave off god's vengeance I think it's more helpful to think of God as the creator and as someone who has created the whole world, God has claimed the firstborn that like this one is the one that is my own. I have created this one, but this is the only one I'm going to take in a way. Yeah, Mary Ellen. Well, <clears throat> I'm seeing um, a conflict that okay. when we were talking about uh, the firstborns um, and the Passover. Mm -hmm. that, um, we were talking about the firstborn males and that if a girl had been firstborn, she was passed over and if a male came next, then he was the firstborn male. This specifies only, how am I going to phrase this? Um, for the dark oh the first four. okay and so it talks here about the firstborn that opened the womb mm -hmm. um so is this the firstborn male opening the womb or is it the firstborn child opening the womb mm -hmm. yeah clay uh verse 13 Yes. Be firstborn of man among your sons, you shall redeem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I just assumed it was male. Well, what, what's this business about the, the firstborn donkey redeemed by the sheep? If you don't redeem it, you break its neck. Oh, hold dirty. on. We're, we're going to get to one thing at a time because there's it's lots dark. of details here. <laughs> so, um, is yeah, it, Larry? Is it, uh, you know, they're talking about people, male and female people, they're also talking about animals. This is that they're very specific about what to do with the people. They're a little less specific about what to do with the animal. It doesn't make much difference whether it's a he cow or a she cow, you know, it's just the first one. It, it does make a difference. So okay. uh, there is two parts to verse 12. So I in the like Hebrew way of repetition, you need both of them together because there's the, um, if you remember the stylistic thing that happens a lot in the poetry side, it also happens in prose because they just like doing this. Um, so the first one that opens the womb, all the firstborn of your livestock that are males okay. shall be the Lord's. So okay. um, the ambiguity here is actually 
and this is one that I don't know, is if you have, let's say, a sheep, and the firstborn of the of that sheep is a female, do you wait to sacrifice for the male, or is it only when the firstborn is a male? That's the thing that I actually oh. don't know, is oh, okay. if the secondborn <laughs> is a male, does do you consecrate that one? Don't know. So, um, but the the sacrifice, yes, is only for males. Okay. Okay, redeem means something. Okay, can you give us a synonym? Uh, uh, what what is it? Doesn't mean it doesn't make sense. I mean, what does exactly does redeem mean? What what are we so, redeeming? Um. So we're, I'm going to go back to the creation story here to help try to walk us through this. So God is a creator God. God created all of the earth, the land, the water, the air, the birds, the animals, all of that. Which means God is technically the owner of all of that. Um, almost like a painter paints something and then owns the painting. However, as a part of the creation story, if you remember, God hands over some of that to Adam and Eve for them to tend. In that way, humans are kind of tenants and God is a landlord. And so in that kind of relationship where humans are caretakers of God's creation, God still technically owns it and therefore needs to be paid in a way. So that's one way to think of it is like tenant and landlord. So what God has sent, set the rent as is the firstborn males. Is that a helpful way to think about it? Well, it's, it's, it's helpful, but it's certainly very different from, the, as you say, the Christian interpretation. Yes, it, it is. Even yeah. in the same, mm -hmm. yeah. So this is one of the things where it, I think it gets to be a little mind bendy because we use the same words and we mean different things. And Very this is where a lot of religious conflict can come up is when we think we're talking about the same thing and we're not. And so this one, this version has nothing to do with sin. It is purely that like God is owed something as the creator and these are God's chosen people. And so God has given them special privileges. And so this is the, the their side of the covenant as, or <laughs> kind of using covenantal language. Uh, this is their end of the bargain. So redeem, um, so God, by redeeming these things, they are basically giving it to God in tribute not because they're afraid of God's punishment, but as they're into the bargain. So we still had some questions uh, walking through this. So the firstborns of the livestock that are males will be sacrificed. And so that one is literally, um, the connotation is that they would be um, ritually killed drained uh, because there's a big no-no about eating blood we've already seen that way back in genesis don't eat blood um so drained and then burned is the assumption um that they would either be roasted um we'll get some of the details on what sacrifices actually look like in a temple setting coming up but that's the the assumption is that there will be a ritual in which the meat is either burned up or cooked to be eaten you know, it's an interesting, where on earth did this idea come that you had to kill somebody or an animal so to placate God or to pay God back? That is really a bizarre idea. And yet it is one of the most common things we see across the world is that yeah. the idea that you kill something in mm -hmm. order to yeah. assert control over the natural world pops up in most cultures at some point in time. Yeah, I know. I know it's, it certainly was true in the Mexican. Or oh, the Aztecs? Yes. A lot of nasty stuff that went on there. 
but you see it even like we think of like the spartans and the athenians of being these refined people they did child sacrifice too like when the god when it seemed like the gods were going haywire child sacrifice was a solution to try to placate the greek gods um we see it i mean if you go far enough back it's often there's a tipping point where people decide killing children is a bad idea but especially when it seems like things are going to pieces and the natural world is going into chaos in hard times even cultures that say no child sacrifice turn to it in desperate situations it is actually i don't know what in humanity makes us do this but it is extremely common like almost disturbingly common across the world um, I mean, even think about how we talk about King Kong and the the sacrifice of the young maiden or the jokes about like throwing the young maiden into the volcano to stop it erupting. These are just it. I I don't know how to give you more in a, of an explanation, but it's actually really common and animal sacrifice pops up in so many cultures so there's something that seems to be within humanity that replicates this again and again yeah mary ellen you look like you're going to jump in the mayan and aztec cultures to um how widespread and how far back in history um this sacrifice actually goes because it's not just a, a european asian thing you know, um, when it's in Central America and you know South America and so on, it's cross continent as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are uh, there the other one that I've known I've read about is, and there's a little there's a lot of nuance in this, and like each culture has their own explanation. But in far north cultures, so we're talking about like Arctic region, they, um one of the things that I've read about is that in really cold winters and where food is really scarce, it is not a celebrated thing and it's not a ritual sacrifice to placate gods, but it's of tribal survival is they would occasionally um, kill children because it's one of those that they, they knew they either wouldn't survive or the tribe wouldn't survive. And the question is who dies? Do you have some cultures do it where um, I uh, one way to do it is the um, basically elderly women had a or uh, I think this is one is more East Asian, where if times were hard, grandma would basically say, hey, I'm going to go live in the woods, which was actually a way of basically her choosing her family's life over hers. And there was like a ritual spot to go to die versus other cultures that chose that we won't be able to feed this infant and stay alive. Therefore, we can make another child, but if I die, the child will also die. So it's just more expedient to kill the child. And so we have all this way of trying to deal with the fact that life is hard, the environment is not predictable and sometimes very harsh, and so sacrifice of animals and at some point, like humans and children was a way of trying to assert control over a chaotic world. So this, it's interesting seeing how long cultures kind of hold on to the ritual sacrifice. Um, as I've brought up today, I've been to a sacrificial temple. It still happens today. It's not very common. Most cultures are like, no, we don't placate gods with animals but we do see it at some point in most cultures my the sun here is yeah me. slash of sunlight yeah so i don't know what's causing that anyways <laughs> yeah, so, it looks like there's a crack it looks like there's a crack in your screen no it's the sunlight is come is like at the perfect spot of the window here give me a second i'm going to me i'm gonna sit down um that's all that <laughs> <laughs> so the with the question of why do you not sacrifice a donkey and i have a very simple answer donkeys are not tasty animals one the other side of sacrificing animals 
is it was a way that the community could kill an animal and then everyone gets to eat. So mm -hmm. most sacri there are parts of the animal that you burn up in entirety. The fat of the animal is supposed to be burnt up as the offering to God. But after you sacrifice the animal, you roast it, you eat it. And donkeys are just, don't eat donkeys. That was just one of theirs that they don't want to eat donkeys. And so if you have a firstborn male of a donkey, sacrifice a sheep so we can eat it. <laughs> so that's why you don't sacrifice donkeys. <laughs> There may be a there may be like a different reason given later on in Leviticus or something, but the practical like the the boots on the ground version is they just didn't want to eat it. Yeah, it's eating a donkey doesn't sound very appealing. <laughs> no, no, it doesn't. I also I don't think donkeys give birth as frequently as sheep, so that also may be like another thing where sheep birth more and you kind of keep more sheep than you do oh. donkeys and so it may be a bigger impact if you were to kill a donkey that one i don't actually know i think that that's a, an estimated guess but the other thing that you god does not want you to actually kill is the firstborn male so if you think once again about if using the metaphor we're going with is like God is the the landowner of all of creation the firstborn is God's property you have to redeem the firstborn male humans but as we saw in Abraham God doesn't want you to kill humans so you kill an animal in the place of a human so that's how you redeem the firstborn male is yes the firstborn male is God's but they will they will have different responsibilities they i mean the firstborn is the one who inherits they have a bunch of other responsibilities so you're going to sacrifice a sheep or goat in their place so does that make more sense now yeah mm -hmm. and so once again we have the explanation of how do you teach this to your children when they see uncle over here sacrificing something because you just had a cousin born this is what you tell them uh because the lord killed the firstborns in egypt we don't want god to kill you so we're going to kill this sheep in replacement so any additional let's see uh any additional thoughts on sacrifice on all the instructions for the passover redemption or consecration <laughs> but consecration is a different is different yes it's... so by I'll... redeeming the firstborn you make them holy so you're unlike the animals that you oh, kill redemption you, right. so redemption kind of gives them this holier status for the no. consecration oh, be baptized to to consecrate right the baptism is a form of consecration consecration yes there there's other practices of like how to make yourself holy before uh before sacrifices but that's a different discussion mary ellen you look like you were gonna do this commentary um for and i'm sorry i had cataract surgery last week and i'm not seeing small print very well but i think yeah. it's the commentary for um Anyway, I'm not pulling it up. It's um, the comment that is in here is redemption has an overtone of protection. Oh, okay. And I'm Ooh. thinking um, of what you just said about we don't want to sacrifice our firstborn, so we sacrifice an animal in its place to protect the firstborn and these two pieces are falling together for me so i just mention it yeah. yeah that that yeah i like that other that additional piece of information that we're doing this as protection we are remembering the past but we're protecting our people yeah yeah that overtone part yeah mm -hmm. okay so let's continue on um uh on verse in verse 17 we get we're like back to the story we're back to the action 
Um, and what we find is that um, the people are in process of in the process of leaving. But it's not directly that they are going to like immediately. Um, how do I say this? Uh, it's not like they can jump in a car and two hours later, they're going to be in the Holy Land. Because they're walking, they're walking with animals, they're walking with children, they are rolling probably carts of their belongings, they're going to be moving slow. And so the process of leaving, I feel like in a lot of the movies, it's like they they rush out and then it very much jump cuts to Pharaoh thinking about what he's done and like immediately changing his mind. And it the process is much faster in film, partially because film needs to keep our interest. But we see that there's a kind of a pause in time. And so we get this in this um, kind of interlude of like the people coming out and it's going to take time. So when the Pharaoh let people go, he did, and we get the explanation here of like, why didn't they go directly to Canaan or the land of Cana? They, there's a more direct route, but we hear kind of this inner monologue of God say, um, God did not leave them in the, in the land of the Philistines. So the Philistines are the ones who are, who are along the coast. That would be the direct route. Because if the people face war, right as they're going to leave Egypt, they're going to turn right back. They don't want to fight a war. They're not like feeling confident enough. So I'm going to lead them specifically in a roundabout way. So even from the beginning of the people like initially leaving Egypt, God is saying they're not ready for conflict. Let I'm going to make this journey longer on purpose just to give them some time. So what do we think of, yeah. It's interesting that the commentators are speculating about what's on God's mind. Yeah, uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. I mean, no, and for all of a sudden, this all-controlling God that had been hardening Pharaoh's heart and causing all these plagues suddenly gets worried. Geez, maybe somebody's going to object to their going and start a war and <laughs> why you know why is he and is it solely so they can get to the red sea <laughs> to get to the next story i don't know what do you want to think <laughs> I, I um i do have a question okay. um I believe in five minutes so um for next week, could you um, give us a map of what the route looked like, or do you have it now? I have it now. All right. <laughs> I was pulling it up because it's one of those that I it's it's helpful to kind of see. Um, I was trying to see if I could find the one that's in my Bible specifically, but this is using modern day Google Maps, um, yeah. and this is one estimation. Is they kind of go over here, they go up. Macro. Um, Mount Sinai at the, we mm -hmm. don't know the actual location there is a mountain that we call Mount Sinai but there's a few locations scholars don't actually know but there is it's at the bottom of the Sinai Peninsula here mm -hmm. so we can see um let's see this one is close to the one that's in my bible uh so there's like a few routes that we see um Lower Egypt, um, when you see lower and upper Egypt, if you, uh, lower Egypt is the thing that is north, because in the Egyptian mind you, upper Egypt is at the beginning of the Nile and lower Egypt is at the end of the Nile. So that's why it's called oh. lower Egypt. So that's, oh, that's where they were leaving from. And so they're kind of leaving Egypt. They are not going this upper route, if you see towards the the Mediterranean, they are going down. And there's a few touch points where um, the the Red Sea here is not as thick as in other places. One of the, uh, so I brought this up at the beginning of Exodus. Um, 
that one of the issues that they that translators have with the Dead Sea Scrolls is this is one of the translation differences between the Dead Sea Scrolls and the, the traditional text that we've been using for um, the Old Testament is that the Red Sea gets translated as the Sea of Reeds. So a lot of people imagine that um, the Exodus is like passing by here at like the thick part of the Red Sea when there is a question of at with this, like the Dead Sea Scrolls are an older version of what we actually have. Um, I know my Bible kept it as this Red Sea, but then put a little note of the Sea of Reeds. So the question is, are they march, Are they crossing towards a, a big body of deep water that God is going to like move in the very like Charleston Heston big walls of water? Or are they going across marshland that can still gum up your tie that the wheels of chariots, but it's like this much water, not like that much water that's one of the questions of the exodus that we uh that is a modern question now because we have this other tradition so well, there's kind of a guess of like where in the connection between egypt and the sinai peninsula are they going they seem to be going more south the you know i remember asking about how long it took joseph and his family go to go back and forth between Mm -hmm. uh, it, and it just seemed like it took just a few days. And you said it was a different route, but how did they manage not to go across the Nile? It looks like, is, is that the Nile there or no? Uh, they, they, how did they manage to deal with a body of water? They probably would have been east of the Nile. And if they needed to cross oh. it, they had ways to cross it. They're not trying to cross the like the the thick part of the Nile, they're probably already in the Delta and there's ways that they would have crossed. Oh. So they oh. don't have to worry about crossing the, the, the Nile River itself. But it didn't take them as long as it took Moses to get to Canaan and back. You know, they, they were um, going back and forth. So Joseph and his family were likely using the Northern route because it's a lot quicker. It's probably not a few days, it's probably a few weeks. But we're going to see a few weeks is nothing compared to 40 years. <laughs> yeah. All righty. So let's see. We have about 10 minutes. Um, let's get to the to this last of it. Uh, so we see in verse 17 that God doesn't want to lead them in a route that would lead to war. Because it's different when like a family of traders is passing through a town versus what we're talking about is thousands of people and everything they have. They don't want either to feel like someone's being attacked. They also don't want to be attacked because they have the women and the children and they are easy targets at this point. However, we see in verse eight at the end of verse 18 that they are prepared for battle. So mm -hmm. there are people who are basically acting as soldiers knowing that they are easy targets. So they are preparing for battle. They're not thinking this is gonna be an easy exit. And here in verse 19, there's a detail I told you to hold on to at the end of Exodus or at the end of Genesis. And here we find it coming back around. Moses took with him the bones of Joseph who had required a solemn oath to the Israelites saying, God will surely take notice of you and then you must carry my bones with you. Mm -hmm. So Joseph is finally leaving Egypt, mm -hmm. which was the promise that we had in his old age at the end of Genesis. He's like, don't let me stay here. Mm -hmm. So they kept his bones and now they're carrying him out. <laughs> so, um, uh, they're going out from Sikoth, which is a place of booths, which means they're camping out. Um, they are camping in this other place at the edge of the wilderness. And what they're finding is that they are going forth into like towards the wilderness, into the wilderness. And God is showing them the way. This is where we get the imagery of by day, God is a pillar oh. of clouds and by night, a pillar of fire. They are traveling day in and day out, 
And this is one where we see God is in one location. God is traveling before them, not as like this all knowing thing and like telling Moses, turn right, turn left. God is visibly present in front of them as a pillar, a pillar of smoke or a pillar of fire and moving before them, which is pretty, a pretty cool image in my mind. So, <laughs> so what do you all think of like this, like leaving that God is choosing to, is not just choosing for them not to go one route, but is literally leading the way in a very visual, very impressive way. <laughs> it makes it sound more like a movie. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's spectacular. It's uh, the big event. Mm -hmm. I think it would impress upon them that this was important and they were going to finally get to leave. And I don't think they would turn back. This is this is too impressive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And they didn't know about movies. <laughs> no, that's right. right. It does yeah. make a, a great visual. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Gary. Well, it's it's a graphic constant. You can you can constantly see the the pillar, whether it's fire or smoke, versus just words. It's a it's a real interaction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is one where there's like I wouldn't think there is much doubt of what's right. going on if you saw a pillar of fire in front of you. Like, <laughs> although I wonder what it was like for Moses to be, yeah, see that flaming pillar? We need to walk towards it. <laughs> <laughs> Convincing the people to walk towards the scary thing. Um, mm. But it is awe inspiring and. <laughs> so next we will see, or. So keeping some of these details in mind, I mean, of how visual God is being, of how present and with the people God is being, we're going to see some of the reactions of the Israelite people. And so kind of thinking through, or do we think their reactions are reasonable? Do we think that they are, I want us to kind of put ourselves in their shoes and kind of think through what they are thinking through, because they're not going to have an easy time about it. And so they're going towards the wilderness right now. And next chapter, we're going to get to the Red Sea or the Sea of Reeds. And we're going to see their response. Because they're not out of Pharaoh's clutches yet. They're, they may think they're on easy street following God in this pillar. But the story's not done yet. <laughs> so any final thoughts for today? All right. Well, we're done a little bit early, but uh, if we don't have any other comments, shall I pray us out? Yes. All right. Yeah. Let us pray. Gracious God, it seem would seem like seeing a pillar of fire of cloud before us would make it so there's no doubt would wipe away all the questions, would secure our faith for ages to come. And yet, God, we know that questions linger. We look at your world and we see that it is beautiful. And yet we still have questions. We still have wonderings. We are still looking for you and looking for ways that you are present in our lives. Help us to remember that we are yours, that you are the God of all creation, that you have given us the joy of being caretakers, which comes as both a blessing and a responsibility. So help us take care of each other. Help us take care of the creation you have given us. Help us remember that things are holy and sacred and that some things are owed to you, our creator. So help us give what is owed to you, whether that be our time, our attention, whether it be the work before us or just the work of caring for each other. 
So I ask that you bless this group. Help us constantly be looking for you, even if it's not in a pillar of fire and smoke, but help us look for you in the songs of birds and in the smiles of others. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Chris. Of Thanks. course. That was great. All right. See you all next week. Okay. Okay.